All right, so let's so let's make it official. Um, hello, everybody on board. We're going to have a panel on the matters of spirit. Uh, we understand spirit in extremely broad way. Spirit encompasses everything. Matter is spirit, spirit is matter, at least so I feel. So we really don't know what's going to happen, um, except for one thing. When I was thinking whom I'm going to invite uh, to be with me on this panel, I was thinking about some people who in the past or at present added something to my life and added something to my life in spiritual sense. So that was the first thing. And the second thing, I wanted to have various voices and various perspectives. So I wanted to have a woman, I wanted to have minority people. I wanted to have white guy who speaks like a freaking vampire. I wanted to have all possible perspectives on the matters of spirit. So I invited Curry. Curry is my buddy from Michigan, fellow Pistons fan, representing woman voice and feminist poetry and stuff like this. Danny is somebody who introduced me to spoken word some 15 years ago or so. And then I read his stuff and was very impressed. Uh, and Scott Woods is my buddy from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, a really funny guy doing very unusual things in terms of one man show and 24 years, um, 24 hours readings and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm not going to say more about our panelists because we all felt that our bios are on the um, festival program. So if you want to find out more, you'll go there and you read about us. And rather than that, <clears throat> um, we're just going to move on and we'll open that with the first poem. I'm going to read sort of opening poem, uh, which is called The Sacred Space. <clears throat> Let me hold on. I'm holding on. So Tom is going to display some, some pictures which go with this poem, a little bit of background. Uh, the poem grew up with my interest in spirituality, specifically Zen Buddhism, but also from teaching courses in environmental ethics. <clears throat> Uh, so I was reading some stuff uh, about environment and the change of human beings to environment and certain things started to gel in uh, and I put it all together and added some images, almost all images, go back Tom, yeah. uh, almost all images are mine uh, and we'll fumble it because it's under hers, but let's give it a shot. <clears throat> a wise, go back. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you this. <clears throat> a wise man was asked, how much of the earth is sacred space? Where can we find the great spirit? Standing upright in his ceremonial robe, holding a spear in one hand, he said, you can find the great spirit everywhere. All of the earth is sacred space. In the beginning, there was the grand vastness, the heavens and the earth, plants, animals, humans, are born from it, through it, within it, complete, flawless, nameless, like the grand vastness. All of the world is sacred space. Those who have wisdom know no name that can be named is the true name, but we are humans, we name names. With names, the 10,000 things are born and some seem good some bad, so we try to separate good from evil. So we carve places from the rest of the earth, surround them by walls and fences, decorate with high ceilings, images of the divine hovering above, stained glass windows, sifting bright light as if from another world, tall towers pointing to the sky. We name them temples with an irony, 
for the name temple means the place that is carved up. How much of the world is sacred space? All of it. Black Elk, a Lakota holy man says, every step that we take upon you should be done in a sacred manner. Each step should be as a prayer. When the great master Joshua asked, what is Buddha? He replied, the oak tree in the garden. On one occasion, a monk approached the great master Deiryu and said, the 10,000 things pass away. What is the body of truth that remains? And the master replied, the autumn mountain foliage spreads like a brocket. The water in the valley remains indigo blue. But once we establish our temples, once we establish our cut of places, they become our places of worship. The only places where we believe the divine would reveal itself. Some think it wrong to love the world outside. Some preach it is the Satan's dominion. Some pray to be released from the demon of the earth, and some proceed to plunder the world, spreading further and further the empire of iron and cement, murdering plants, animals, even humans, especially humans, especially those who worship outside of our temples, outside of our cut off places. And thus we have arrived at today. Our mother raped and wounded bleeds in front of us while we like vermin gnaw upon her intestines can this cure our hunger, fear and pain. How can we return to the source? At the beginning, there was a grand vastness. The 10,000 things are born from it, through it, within it. Complete, flawless, nameless, like the grand vastness. All of the world is sacred space. All right, so that's the opening. <clears throat> um, and I know, I know, I have a sense who is going next, representing all Chicano people, all the way from Albuquerque through Rochester, Minnesota. Let's give it up for Good body. It's so good to see you, Danny. It was a long time no see. Hit it up to the ballpark. Well, thank you, Stefan. I will do my best. And I want to say I'm really um, honored to be asked to do this and really happy to be here to, uh, to be with, you know, the other esteemed panelists and Stefan and everybody that's working on this festival, which looks like dynamite uh, looking at it on online and the, the lineup. It's an incredible amount of work. And as an organizer myself, I want to just want to honor that uh, for a minute. Uh, so yeah, all of that. And uh, I guess I will do a poem before I talk too much. Uh, I've got rules, poetry rules. Uh, one is that the intro should not be longer than the poem. So to save myself from that foible, I'm just going to do this poem, which is called The Other Thing. I don't want this light or the way these bright inviting surfaces bend the air and light and bounce it around off these pedantic, eager, righteous, learned, hip, perky, earnest voices. I don't want illumination or stories of ancient manuscripts. I don't want the knowing looks of professors, grad students, worldly or otherwise enlightened fuckers plucking at my soul. Images of great art surround me like a school of crazed and diseased fish relentlessly snapping at my brain, vision, spirit. I don't want clarity or revelation or visions or any of the other much sought after and I guess highly overrated merchandise the gurus and shamans and priests sell to keep their various ashrams and lodges and churches full of nice clean gold and their stomachs full of nice clean food. No, I want the other thing the bigger, darker-eyed thing that swoops with wings that glow and strikes with fangs that burn and clings with claws that rip the truth from human guts the damn thing had Van Gogh and wouldn't let go for a second. 
It sucked his too human soul out through his hands and brushes and vomited it on canvas that we now revere and charge millions and millions of dollars for the tracks of the same dragon that had its flaring nostrils stuck inside the bell of Coltrane Sachs and Chet Baker's horn till they were both sucked dry. The winged demon angel of a million nights, of a million shades of blue and black, of a million million stars gleaming in the dark sky maws of wolves and sharks and tigers. The lucky ones walk the safe daytime trail and say, my goodness, look at those footprints. Other poor fools search the night for the fickle god beast, hoping for a glimpse of those eyes before the claws sink in. The rest never have a choice, a chance, a say in the matter. They pay the price, and we sit and drool and do and da ah, over the glowing words, pictures, music the dragon has painted with their hearts, minds, spirits. And here comes dusk again and the dust of evening is lifted by night's blue breath and begins to take the shape of great dark wings and a great hunger wakes in a small place and begins to grow still unsatiated by all that has gone before. Ravenous hunger, purple, irresistible wings, black, unlimber as one, and dawn is an entire sad, wild universe away. Thank you. Um, it, it, you know, it, this is not the Q&A section. So uh, if anybody does have a question about that poem or, or anything, I would love to hear it later when we get there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, spirituality, for me, uh, spirituality is really wherever you find it. And, you know, just poetry and spirituality seem to really go together but it, spirituality, I think we at times can overlook that anything we do or, or endeavor to do can be spiritual, right? And uh, I don't even think that we have to say, oh, I'm gonna be spiritual and do my laundry. If we do it in a way that is, that is you know, purposeful and, and if we go about it with some sort of exuberance then I think we imbue a holiness into that task. And uh, I'm reminded of that by poets that I love when Neruda can write an ode to slicing lemons or, or ode uh, to tomatoes or a, an ode to a, to a sturgeon in the fish market. Or when I work with young people, they always laugh at this one, ode to my socks, right? Dude wrote a poem about his socks because he loved them so much. So I really think that spirituality surrounds us. I think it's everywhere. And it's just whether or not we can dip into that as we go through our day. And I, I don't think we're ever really removed from it. I think it's just, we imagine that we're removed from it. Like we imagine there are these barriers between the different arts and, and we even between different kinds of poetry um, when really I think it's all water dipped from the same well. And I think just the shape, right? Uh, if, if, you, if you pull up a bucket of water, you're like, oh, water shaped like a bucket. And if you have a ladle, you'll say, oh, no, no, water shaped like a ladle, you know, or, or whatever it, the, the vessel may be. But it's, I think it's the same energy. And, and uh, so, so for me, uh, it really is wherever wherever you find it. And, and one of the most sacred things I think is, you know, when, when kids play, and I know people like to remind me, kids can be mean and, and all that stuff. Sure they can. Um, but at the same time, I've seen a whole lot of what I consider to be the sacred or the holy uh, in the play of children. And, uh, you know, somebody who really believed that, that creating art and the, the act of creation was a holy thing was Prince. And I go back, I go back to Prince a lot and, you know, listen to his music and think about his ideas and views and what he put into his music and what he said uh, outside of his music. And I, for today's uh, panel, and I'm not gonna go and fill in the blank on each one of these, but I wanted to share uh, Prince's 
uh, seven laws or axioms of spirituality. I don't know if they're laws. I don't know. He'd be like, I'm Sheriff Prince and I'm here to enforce the spiritual law. Probably not. But, uh, you know, and these are pretty common. And I think at some point, uh, a lot of these things become universal, like the water that I was uh, discussing before. Number one, there's more to life than pain and suffering. Well, I sure hope so. Uh, the end is coming soon, so do what matters now. That's number two. Good advice, good advice. You know, I knew a kind of an old holy man. He was an old drunk, really. Ray Flaherty, I'll say his name. And uh, he wasn't what anybody would consider like a good person. Uh, but he liked to say, do something, even if it's wrong. Uh, so... Number three, social consciousness is a natural outgrowth of spirituality. It's, uh, that it sounds so, I mean, it sounds so simple, but I think a lot of us miss that. I think a lot of us miss that, you know? Um, I think there's a whole lot of spirituality and empathy and uh, listening to one another's stories, you know? Number four, Greed is the root of all evil. You notice he doesn't say money because I think we could have money and we could have possessions, but I don't think it's necessarily the things that create the evil. It's our reaction to them. And I will say this about competition in, in Poetry Slam, which some people love and some people hate, and I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it, but the slam in and of itself is not a bad thing. But a lot of times how people react to it when they're in it and they become of it, you know, like that phrase, the world I'm in, be, be in the world, but not of it, be in the slam, but not of it, you know? Anyway, uh, it's the greed, right? Whatever that is, greed for more money, greed to win, greed for points, uh, greed for possessing another person, I think. So greed is the root of all evil. Um, number five. Creativity is a sacred healing force. And I believe that's true. And I believe the, you know, the wise fool and the, the, the uh, trope of the jester being wiser than the, the king or the, the emperor or whoever. Um, and I, you know, that's why I think there's so much imagination and creativity in the way that children play. And that to me is, is when it becomes holy at times. Um, Sensuality is not antithetical to spirituality. That is something that if you're paying attention is in like every line and every beat and every note of Prince's music. Uh, you know, even a song like Sometimes It Snows in April to me is, is filled with sensuality and sexuality. There's, there's a, a dynamism and energy there that is just beautiful and, and yes, holy. Um, and number seven, unconditional love is the greatest truth. And, you know, I'm still kind of pondering that one. I mean, it would be easy to just say, yes, go Prince, you know, um, I agree, but I I'm sure he's right in some ways, but for me, I'm still trying to get there. I'm still walking that road and trying to figure that out exactly what he meant by that. And, um, because, to think of unconditional love as truth, as truth, uh, it seems to me, and maybe it's because, you know, I have greed for certain things, that real unconditional love requires some sacrifice. So, I don't know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe the sacrifice becomes its own gift so that you're not really sacrificing anything, but then you're trying to gain something. Hmm, see what I mean? Anyway, still figuring that out. Um, I think my hour and a half of time is coming to a close any minute now. So, uh, and I really feel like I talked enough and uh, the, the, one of the last things I wanna say is, is in terms of spirituality and you have, you have Buddhists and you have, you know, Catholics and Taoists and you, you know, Jews and Muslims. And, and then you have, you know, heretics like me who's like been on his own path for a long time trying to be uh, in, in this world. 
and of the spiritual world, of the water that is spirituality. Uh, I like to say there, there are as many paths as there are walkers. And I truly believe that. So, um, you know, I think everybody trying to, trying to find their own way is a wonderful thing. And I think we should try to help each other along that path. And it doesn't always mean that we say, go, go, you know, you're doing great, Danny. You could be like, no, Danny, that's come back. Your head's on fire. I think that's part of it too, you know? So um, it's not all about just loving everything that everybody does and branding it holy or spiritual. I think sometimes people need to be like, guided, I know I do, guided back or guided away from things or taught things. Um, right. We've got a lot of different teachers in life. And, and I think that, that uh, you know, obviously experiences are teachers, but human beings are teachers, but they don't always come in the guise of, of someone who's going to be gentle with you. Sometimes, and sometimes they don't even know they're, they're teachers and they do something or say something. And maybe in the moment it's, it's hurtful. Um, but, you know, maybe we, there's, there's a special lesson therein for, for us. So I think. Thank you, Danny. <clears throat> that was Danny at his most minimalistic, folks. You had a pleasure right there. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say one thing because you inspired me. Um, I read it somewhere, I would swear, but then I couldn't find it. And I asked people around and they couldn't find it either. So maybe I made it up, but I, I would swear I read it. And it's a Buddhist proverb. It says this, to an unawakened mind, reading a holy scripture is like reading a newspaper. To an open mind, reading a newspaper is like reading the holy scripture. So that's, a, that's driving of what you're saying, or what you said, being spiritual is about how we do it and what kind of attitude we have, what we do. Anything can be spiritual and anything can be shit. It depends on how we do it. <clears throat> uh, all right, so, uh, so the next at the bat, uh, representing herself, and all women in the world? Uh, I don't think so. You know, I just I just want to say, you know, Scott, I feel like uh, ending, Danny ending on the seven rules of spirit, spirituality of Prince uh, was wondering if that's a segue, if you want to jump in here. Uh, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I trust you implicitly. Oh, thanks. Um. Thanks for that, Scott. Um, so when uh, when Stefan first asked me to be on this panel, um, I think my first reaction was, wow, I am so honored. And wow, you've got the wrong person. Um, <laughs> you know, because I, I knew that Stefan and, and Danny were going to um, really be able to embrace that concept of spirituality on the bigger level. And so I was, and Stefan insisted, no, 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 you're, you're in the right place. Um, so I was looking through my, my poems, trying to figure out how spirit, um, where I find spirit in my poems. Um, I'm somebody who writes a bunch of persona poems told from the point of view of circus freaks. Um, I, I didn't think it was in any of those, but I, I, as I was going through my, my stuff, I found there, there were some poems that I had written either to or about or in memory of um, uh, those beings who come into our life who leave just such a mark that, um, that after they're gone, they're not gone all the way. Um, so, um, so I'm probably gonna cry. <laughs> um, and I hope that that's okay. Uh, so the, the first piece that I wanna read um, is a poem that I wrote after attending, let me back up. You know, everybody says that, uh, 
you know, when I die, I want my funeral to be a celebration and um, it never really happens. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, and I had got, I attended a funeral a few years back that actually was that celebration. And there's only, there are very few people I know who could have lived a life that would have merited a funeral like that. And Blair was one of them. Um, if you knew Blair, uh, you know of what I speak. He was um, songwriter, poet, creator, and just all around wonderful, joyous spirit. Um, everybody in in Michigan and, and Detroit just loves Blair. And um, so anyway, uh, so after attending that amazing funeral, um, I wrote this processional for David Blair. When you died, a parade poured out of your mouth. Minuscule tubas honked, butterfly wing parasols waved, a dreadlock conductor led the way, shrilling his whistle, stomping his feet in syncopated 4-4 four -four time across the pavement of your chest, trying to stir an echo thumping up through the soles of his feet. The police, bewildered, didn't know what to make of the mournful hullabaloo, tried to cross your lips with yellow tape. But when the drum line burst through, the cops shrugged, flipped down their swirling lights, and escorted the procession down your arms, over the steel string calluses of your fingers, and out onto the pockmarked streets of Detroit. The coroner, tried to close the smiling gate of your mouth, but a never-ending magician scarf of marginalia just kept bubbling out. Guitar picks and drag queens, circus freaks and preachers, manhole cover, tambourines, all of it rolling down your legs, bouncing over your feet, clattering its jubilescent way down Woodward. They say Rodin's mock thinker danced a rusted jig that day. They see Rivera's industry skidded to a halt, workers and foremen alike peeling off their gray painted hats. They say, for a moment, the air was made of music. Uh, and my cat is, is going to join in here. Um, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, it, yep, here we go. <laughs> My cat loves Zoom meetings, attends all of them with me. Um, so I guess that is my cue to uh, to head into a, a poem that, you know, it's not just the people in our lives that have that, um, that leave that indelible mark on our spirit, um, if they have one that is so large. Uh, a few years back, I went to... Um, I attended the uh, Bear River Writers Conference in Northern Michigan. Um, and the, the first year that I went, uh, right when I came home, um, uh, my beloved, beloved dog, my, my soul dog, uh, my Horcrux, um, I had to have her put down the very next day. Um, and so Bear River became a difficult place for me to, um, to go back to. And, uh, this one workshop, uh, a couple years later, we got paired up with someone else on the first day and we had to write a poem to that person. And uh, this person who I met uh, had just lost her dog. Um, and we were talking about that, you know, the, the thing that everybody says about, you know, you'll, you'll know when you're ready for a, for a new one. Um, and, uh, so this was my this was my poem. This was my poem for her. Um, and an, and an interesting thing happened throughout the course of the um, of the writers conference is that uh, I shared this poem and all of these people uh, <laughs> came up to me about it. And there were so many people there who had just lost beloved animals in the past year and and. Um, I kind of became a, a grief Sherpa and it helped me deal with my own um, by, by sharing this and, and helping other people with theirs. Um, so uh, this was for Nancy. 
you will know when you are ready is a lie. It will get easier with time is also a lie. Rather, this new and ragged space will elbow its way in so hushed and insistent that there will be days that will merely hover at the edge of your vision or lodge in your ears like the tinny wine I carry with me always and sometimes manage to drown out. These will be the good days. But just like the nights when my ears hold the sea and the pressure anchors me and over and over I crack my jaws wide into a vacant scream to try to ease it, so too will this new and empty ocean drown you. And there's nothing to do but surrender when it does. I have told you of good death and to other humans willing to hold vigil over the still and cooling shell that held my heart, of slipping my grief out the side door. I could have gone on about how perfect, uh, excuse me, I could have gone on about how I was held up and together by family, how perfect the warm angles of sun were that day, and how we somehow spent the next hour among animals and the next out to lunch, and how my tongue managed to laugh even if it couldn't taste, but all of this would sound like a lie. So I would have to tell you too of the next day, of the doorbell announcing my heart had returned as ash, and how I suddenly desperately needed to see it, how when my scrabbling fingers couldn't discover how to pry open the plastic container posing as marble, I became a splintered and keening howl until the floor returned me to myself, the shifted shadows and raw cave of my throat hinting how much time I had lost. And this, I know, you will recognize as truth. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I've, I've got, um, I have one more poem, but I'm wondering if maybe Scott wants to jump in and I can do one later if there's time or, um, uh, and Scott. I'm please. certainly willing to, to take your lead on that. Sure. Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Scott Woods. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm going to jump right in here and start with a poem and maybe two, depending on how things feel. And then we can maybe get to the part where we do some talking and maybe some interrogating, right? So I'll start with a piece um, entitled Adam's ribs and chicken and biscuits. I have loved barbecue like I have loved you. Stoked in the mesquite fire of a black bellied stove, flamed with attention, fought with drunken men over the best parts, swallowed hard, set to watering a mouth full of summer gunshot, slathered it with secrets and longing whispered cursing prayers into the heat to make it last just one minute longer in the wavering fade of August. And now you are thinking, he just compared me to a meal, which is not what I have done at all. I have compared my gods to you, given you back that stolen rib and made a meal of it. Look at me. This is no trifling game. I worship at my altars daily and my gods have tried to kill me twice this year. Once by driving my blood into frenzy, salting my veins, doctors everywhere bowing their heads. And then another time while I was driving, my car filled with the hymn that only a bag of pulled pork knows the lyrics to. Plastic clinging to the sweat of its styrofoam, then jarred by the acrid burn of tire screech as I peel myself out of a seatbelt. Engine gone, 
windows eggshelled all over me while I lick the evidence of my complicity from my fingers, smacking lips of love and sauce in my palms. It is a crime usually reserved for driving while writing poems, but then I am an acolyte of many pantheons, wholly ghosting out of me all of the ways to love you. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna do one more real quick. It'll be a shorter piece. And this one, um, between the poem I just did and this one, I think you'll kind of, I have a statement that I can kind of make afterwards about it, but I think you'll kind of see what I'm doing when it comes to this issue, okay? Uh, this piece is entitled The Honey Boy Thug Paradox. She falls all over his coffin, her face a cursing river. All out her mouth fall broken covenants. She cannot hold on to her Sunday school lessons. They spill out of her so fast. She would give everything to be Abraham in this Thursday night chapel, sweating under God's will of chicken skin that knows and casseroles stuffed with consolations, all her cooking knives, God stopped in mid-faith air. A teddy bear will disappear from a chain link fence tonight. A dollar candle sweltering on a beer can will waver, then snuff, then come back. These are gods you can believe in. They don't ask for much. A gutter, 40 ounce libation, the smell of gunpowder at the end of a spades game, a pair of shoes tripping over electric wires on their way to a forgetting heaven. These are consistent gods. These are gods you can rely on. Even the cruel ones who topple coffins under the weight of mothers who cannot try again. A banging prayer of wood and aluminum and amens louder than a church organ, promising, if only for a moment, and slapping limbs into her chest and cheeks, her baby will dance again. Say thanks. So real quick, um, just to make a comment um, kind of about the theme and what I'm doing with it. Um, spirituality is infinitely fluid. As human beings, we try to lock our concept of spirituality into nouns, right? Persons, places, and things. Religion, rituals, love. And as someone who has not practiced a religion for many years, but continues to feel uh, extremely blessed throughout his life, I am uh, often, one might say regularly, driven to seeking, unpacking and fixing spirituality into the stuff of people's lives. I do that because regardless of how you come down on higher powers or cosmic forces, it does a person good to consider how the world manifests itself in their world. And not just what they do to the world or what the world can give them. To the average person, the world is as unknowable and vast as the cosmos. And so it behooves us to consider from time to time how much we do not know, even in the things we see all of the time. And so poetry, for me, helps recontextualize reality for us in potentially useful ways. Uh, when it comes to things like spirituality. I guess that's where I'll kind of leave things as we move on. Thank you for listening. Uh, le let me jump in for a sec. Uh, I meant to say before you read your poems, I met, or I saw and, met, and then met Scott, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or so, when he was on American tour, specifically Texan tour, in one of the cities in Texas, not too far from here. And it was a great 
great reading. And uh, two things really impressed me. One thing was that he was so on the top of his material and the crowd, that was number one. And number two, everything you read, Scott, was on page, but it was so well done. <clears throat> And I and I had a regret that I was I, at that time I was still running the slum here, um, and I had lots of regrets that I couldn't bring you here to Corpus. So, and I know like we talk about me said like next time when I'm in Texas I for sure coming to Corpus. So I'm very happy that you at least that we can at least see you and experience your reading and your poetry via Zoom. Uh, and maybe there will be better times soon. So maybe you'll be on another tour. You always will have home here in Corpus. And of course, everybody else who reads today, that goes without saying. So thank you so much, Scott. Thank you. Um, so so before I move on, Carrie, you said you had one more. You want to read one more? Um, you know, I not. Not right now. I would love to get into, you know, kind of a Q&A and conversation part of this. Um, nobody attends a panel just to hear the panelists talk. Um, conversations are way more, way more fun than sermons. Um, so I, I would love to, to get to talk to see if anybody has any questions or anything. All right. Let's open the room for the, let's open the room for the questions, folks. I don't know what's the best way to do it. Um, because everybody's on mute. So, um, Tom, uh, Tom. Everybody has the ability to unmute themselves now, or they should. Cool. All right. So, if you have a question, unmute yourself and just ask a question or type a question as a text in a chat room, and we'll try to address them as much as we can. <clears throat> can I? Can I just say something before we go to that very first question? Because there was there was something that both Carrie and Scott talked a little bit about, and, and I think it's, I, I want to kind of catch the tail end of that energy before it just we go on just a go. bunch of other things. Is that okay or yeah. no? Go. Okay. 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 Uh, you know, Carrie, when you mentioned Blair, who, you know, rest in peace, what an amazing person. Uh, and and you, know, you were talking about how happy he was and how joyous. And I, I can't say that I really knew Blair, but I did hang out with him a couple of times. And he had he had very dark moods as well, right? And, yeah. and around me, he he there were a couple of times he he just got like, you know, and I I think that a lot of times we look to people of color, whether that's Native American people or black people, um, even Latinos at times to be you know, part of what is called the magical Negro trope, right? It's like, here comes Blair, he's going to make everybody happy. Or here comes Scott, he's going to make us laugh about barbecue and love, you know? Or here comes Danny, and he's going to do this for us, you know? Or here are these Native Americans with their eagle feathers, and it's going to be so spiritual, you know? But it, it, I think if we can't see each other's grief and rage as holy, Right. If, if, if I, as a man, can't can't be comfortable or at least exist in the space with your grief and sorrow and rage as a woman, then then to me, that's the antithesis of of being spiritual, because I'm not I don't want you to be fu fully human in, in that case. Right. If I don't if I'm like, oh, that rage is unladylike, you know, how many times have you heard that right in your life? And it, but you know, to me, it's like sometimes the angels come and they're not, they're not trying to do anything nice. They're, they're full of, of rage and, and, you know, there's redemption in that sorrow and rage, I think. So I just want, I just wanted to like catch the tail end of that because uh, especially your second poem, Scott, you know, just really floored me and, you know, uh, uh, until we begin to really fully see each other, right? It's become popular to say, I see you, I see you. But do you really see me? Or are you just looking at the parts that you want, that you're comfortable with? And, and if I'm gonna, you know, 
treat somebody like I'm going to pick and choose, like you're a menu of emotions that I'm comfortable with that I can just pick and send the rest back. I don't really see you. I don't really see you. You know, I can't. I'm not there. I'm not in a place where I can see you yet. So trying to trying to bridge that gap, right? Thank you. I didn't mean to single you out, Gary, but just thank you. All right, the floor is open for the questions. Anybody who wants to jump in, unmute yourself or, or text it to the chat. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Since no one else has a question, I was just, I, it started with um, uh, Stefan's poem, um, Humans Name Names. And then I feel like just going through each panelist, it seems like there is this theme of how much words have power over us and our perceptions. Um, uh, do you, would you agree with that? I'd, I'd like to hear from each of you or whoever would like to answer that question. Um, can I take this question as the first? Uh, okay. Uh, so like those who know me know that I'm a philosopher, uh, writing philosophical papers and publishing them in philosophical journals. That's work in words. And it's work with the abstractions. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing which I discovered is that this kind of work is a double-edged double sword. Uh, it opens new worlds. It changes our perceptions. So, for example, lots of my research is literally on the issues of environmental ethics and animal rights. Um, and, you know, through this work, I totally changed my way of thinking about animals and nature. Uh, so that's the opening um, aspect of words. But they also locked us into something. And uh, you know, one, one other thing which I do is arts. I play music, I, you know, I, I'm a drummer and I do meditation. And that is tapping into something much more primordial something which underlines everything and really cannot be captured in words. And I have a very good sense that working with the words lock me up and in some sense separates me from this more primordial thing. And at the same time, opens me up to new things, including this primordial thing. So there's this very interesting dialectic you know, related to words. So that's my experience about working with words, either doing academic stuff, but also doing poetry. Uh, poetry is much more intuitive, but academic stuff is also very intuitive. The first you feel something and then you look for ways to express it. So, so that's just my experience, you know, uh, to answer your question. So thank you for the question. And if anybody else wants to continue, please go ahead, guys. Help me out. Danny. Zo, thanks for asking that question. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, be brief so that the panelists have a shot. Yeah, words are incredibly powerful. And, and they affect us all the time. And I don't think that words shut us off from anything. I think we shut ourselves off because of what our preconceptions of what words may do or, or our experiences with them, uh, you know. Uh, Scott, yeah, that's a better way to say it, Danny. That's a better yeah, way to say yeah, it. Well, thanks, I was, uh, thank you. Just cut in any time and cheer me along. But uh, I just, I guess I just feel like, you know, people say that words don't matter and yet you know so many people get upset if 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 they hear someone speaking a different language right like like english only they they say when they hear people speaking spanish or or you know 
uh, words are unimportant, important, but you know, don't call them a son of a bitch. You know, it's only words. It's only words, right? Um, but uh, words, words do have power, and I, I think that to, to constantly recognize that, right, and to to name people what they want to be named is incredibly important, and to get that right, and and it's a it's a way of there's a there's a spirituality and moving through the world with respect for other human beings and, and being aware of that I think that's it thanks I'll jump in here too um you know as somebody who has run an open mic night like every week for about 21 years um something that I figured out somewhere along the way was that the open mic night um, is less about poetry and almost everything about self-expression, right? Um, that's why so many of the poets who come have never done it before. We always have new poets every week. It's, you know, constantly happening that way. And um, at some point, you, I, as the person who runs the show, as the frequent MC, um, you know, at some point I had to stop caring if anybody was any good at it, right? Because that became so unimportant. Um, it was way more important to provide a place for people to express themselves and that they were choosing to do so with words, through language, through presentation of language, you know, which is still one of the greatest recorded fears of man, right? Um, it takes a lot of bravery to get up in front of people and speak anything, right? Even now, in this moment, right? Um, and so I had to, you know, learn how to honor that and to, and to respect that in and of itself, regardless of, you know, what I thought the quality of the work might be or if it might even be a poem, right? Because sometimes that's a question. But, um, but the, the power of that exchange is the exchange, right? And there's a there's something arguably spiritual about that. I guess I'll leave it there. Um, uh, truth. Um, just want to make sure I'm catching things on the uh, on the chat. Um, you know. I, um, I taught for, uh, I'm a librarian by trade, um, but I took a break from um, this career to uh, teach for a few years and I taught writing. Um, and there is, um, <laughs> you know, of course I, I taught creative writing, but there was a joy that I found in teaching the the basic composition class because students come into that class thinking oh I am going to be told how to put something down on the page and instead by teaching writing it's we're really teaching critical thinking is what that class is um, more than anything else and um, you know teaching getting these students to teach themselves about um, the power of their own words and evaluating the words of others and holding them up to the light and making sure that, um, you know, it just, that they're using reliable sources, but just teach, getting them to um, examine the words of others uh, as closely as they're examining their own um, was that, that's church to me. The classroom is church. Um, and uh, there, there is, um, and, and the, the power of young poets finding, um, finding their voice, uh, it, it's just, there's nothing better. And I miss it so much. And um, yeah, it, it um, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna start rambling at this point, but yeah, that's, um, that's, that's where words, words and spirit connect with me is when I'm when I'm sharing and when I'm teaching and when those students are teaching me.
Can I just add to that <clears throat> and just say that agree with, with all the good stuff that's been said here. Um, but I uh, just wanted to add that the, the, the classroom can be a lot of different places, right? In many ways, the open mics and slams that I went to in Boston uh, when I moved there in 1990, well, that was the most instructive and demanding classroom I've probably ever been in, you know? And, and part of that is because, you know, Patricia Smith read every night and usually read new stuff and sometimes wrote something while everybody was reading in the open mic and would close out the open mic by reading something she had just written by hand in a notebook. So, you know, that was kind of what was going on for me at that point. But, but I'm sure that also, you know, Scott, your open mic is a classroom and, and the open mics that other people run our classrooms and just, you know, hanging out at the park when I, when I was a teenager and listening to the older guys talk and, you know, the, the, the lingo that they use, you know, and, and everything, uh, how that affects your ears and your sensibilities. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's all incredibly important and, and uh, you know, thanks everybody. Danny? Sorry, I jumped in there. I couldn't resist. You, you said, cool. So the floor is open, folks. Whomever has any question, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, I have a question. I, I wrote it down, part of it down. I'll just preface it just to thank you all for being here and, and sharing. Thinking about like living in a radical space and just for myself as a, a single queer woman who's older, neurodivergent, differently bodied, always kind of in resistance to the white heteropatriarchal establishment <laughs> um, and teaching in academia, but always kind of like straddling like in academia, but not because it's so is the, you know, there's always this power and privilege um, of the institutional power structure which can be so oppressive and so I found myself um, not not wanting to shut myself off though from this you know all these sort of very personal individual oppressions that come with institutions but the privileged people with privilege and power don't even recognize that they have those privileges and that that oppressive wielding oppressive power they so there's a sense of becoming more and more invisible even as I, I know that I want to keep opening my heart and I, I want to keep listening and I want to keep hearing uh, and I have to. So I feel like those of us who are marginalized are asked to tolerate more, to expand ourselves more, to expand our empathy more. And at the same time as we are resisting so much oppression and so I, I would like to know if you could speak to that, how your, the empathy that, you, that your, uh, your poetry brings to yourselves and to the ways that you expand and, and continue to listen and tolerate and accept and affirm oneself and one another in a world that is, uh, can be quite brutal, cruel, as, as you know, everybody's experienced. I don't know if that's a, a focused enough question, but. Um, let, let me take a stop at it. <clears throat> you know, um, where, where I was growing up, I was, I was growing up in a situation which, which was much more totalitarian and constraining than the fucking worst of the previous president. Um, the worst of the previous president was freaking peanuts comparing to, um, you know, to my childhood. And I also was growing up in a broken family you know, my father was an alcoholic who literally drank himself to death, literally, and destroyed the family on the way. 
And uh, it was extremely troubling. All of that was extremely troubling to me. And uh, sort of a breaking through experience for me was when I took a trip to Auschwitz concentra concentration camp. And the second trip is with, was with my mother who survived the camp and show me, show me everything there, including her bank where, where she slept with 10 or 12 other women. And uh, I sort of had Eureka experience, very liberating experience. Long story short is that unless I work on my compassion and openness, it all of this will haunt me to that. And it's not like it doesn't haunt me, but at least it doesn't destroy me. So, so that's my attitude, you know, like trying to open my mind up and more and more and build up compassion. And, you know, I do trainings, you know, I do meditations which build up compassion. Uh, you know, there are, there are Tibetan styles of meditation when you work on that specifically. Uh, so, but those are details. It's not about, you know, the general attitude. Uh, so that's just my my reaction, you know, and that, that's how I reacted to what was going on to me. And I'm more or less happy with that I reacted in this way. Uh, but at the same time, I'm extremely appreciative of people who have the same attitudes in much more natural way. Like, for example, my girlfriend is much more compassionate than I am in a natural way. She doesn't have to work on it. She just is, you know? So, so, so I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy I'm with her because like that's, that's an opportunity to learn uh, from, from, from my fellow human beings, you know, to be even more open-minded and more compassionate. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to jump in here a little bit. Um, I think uh, more than um, finding compassion in my writing has been the last few years um, finding compassion in spite of not writing. Um, the past few years, um, and you said, Robin, you know, we're just being asked to tolerate more and more and more. Um, I am uh, the survivor of a narcissistic abusive relationship. And um, four years with a narcissist in power in this country, you know, I mean, I, I thought that the, the campaign leading up to the election in 2016 was bad. Um, just watching that um, personality being granted a, a public stage and, um, I remember going, having to teach the day after um, the election in 2016 and just walking into my room and telling my students, I, I got nothing tonight. Uh, we just, we had to just circle our desks and just um, be compassionate with each other for three hours instead of worrying about, you know, learning how to write odes or whatever that night. Um, and so, uh, I think that it's just, um, and I hadn't, I haven't been able to write. Um, I, I have barely written the last few years. And so I think that uh, that the, the greatest thing is, um, you know, find, you're talking about, Robin, about finding, you know, compassion for others and empathy for others. Man, circle your own wagons and find it for yourself mostly. And And if it's, you know, if you can find it, through writing, fantastic. And and if it's not happening, that's okay too, you know? Um, I've had to just give the writer in the corner of my brain, just wrap her up in a blanket and give her a cookie and say, it's okay, <laughs> we come back when you're ready. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it has been a trying time. Here you Thanks for asking. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie, uh, so much for that response. It really resonates with me. And also, Stefan, thank you very much for responding with your experience. If I can say something about writing, 
some people have problems with this. I have problems with writing art, but I'm fortunate I write every day, whatever it is. Sometimes it's philosophy, sometimes are poems. Sometimes I chat with my buddies about basketball, but it's very interesting thing for me that I have created a habit of just writing every day, whatever it is, just using the writing muscles, so to speak. Um, so if you can create some, some way of just uh, like getting yourself in a groove of writing, uh, eventually poems just start happening. They just start coming out. Uh, if you don't think about it as writing poems or writing stories, just, just write. You know, also not writing is fine. Cool. And, yeah. and, waiting, and waiting for the writing to come back. You know, Robin, when you were talking, I, and um, your reality, as you said, as a queer woman who's getting older and the invisibility, and I've heard a lot of women, uh, queer and hetero and, and across the spectrum really talking about how as they get older, they become more and more invisible. And it's, it's become, become kind of a common thing to hear women talk about, you know? And uh, first of all, I don't think you're alone in that and you probably know that already, but, but for me, I would think that one of the things would be to try to find other people who share your experience and, and your reality. And, and uh, you know, now we've got the, these days, we've got the intro nets. So, I mean, there's, there's a little more uh, opportunity to, to connect with people that are more like you. And uh, I feel like doing that can be incredibly refreshing, you know, and, and, and kind of rejuvenating. But, uh, you know, when Carrie says, when you say, Carrie, you haven't written in, in I, think, I think that's fine. I feel like there's a place that we have to go through at times to get to the writing. And, and if you try to rush it, it's kind of like you try to make this flower bloom. I'm gonna grab these petals and you're gonna bloom, goddammit, right now, you know? Rather than being like, oh, here's some water. Here's some sunshine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait a little while, you know? Um, here's some wind, you know, to push on you, to make you grow a little bit stronger this way so that you can get back to the writing. <clears throat> so, you know, I think, I think the waiting, the waiting is fine. It's part of it. And, you know, there was, um, something you said, Scott, when you mentioned the stuff of people's lives, right? And I think, I think whatever that stuff may be, I think, I think there's a spirituality in there. I think there's a sacredness in there. And, and uh, I have a friend who just texted me and she was like, I'm not even sure. I don't feel very spiritual. I don't even, I'm not even sure I know what spirituality means. And, and I, I, I texted, yes, I texted back and I said, I said, that's the secret. There's no separation, right? Like we're, we're in that river, you know, sometimes, sometimes we're waiting and other times we're swimming, but we're, we're always there. There's always that, it's always there, right? It's just a matter of how aware we may be. And there may be, you know, it, it may be that we are, you know, baking pie. And that is, that is the writing for the day. That is that connecting with whatever that, that imagination, that magic, whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, when I think of, uh, I was mentioning Neruda earlier, Mary Oliver is another one, right? If people are familiar with her work, I think there's a, a whole lot of, of great things to be found in there. Um, when she uh, talks about in the summer day, you know, and she talks about, well, she, she doesn't know, quite know what a prayer is. Uh, but but she she does know how to it's something like wander around, which is what she's been doing all day. How to lay down in the grass? There it is. That's everything. That's it right there, right? That's it. I mean, watering your plants, petting your cat, picking a Netflix movie. It's all right there. I'm sorry. I'm going to be quiet now. I'm muting. Self muting. 
Thank God. No, just kidding. <laughs> I know this has been really deep and all, but I have a very mundane question to ask Scott. This is just killing me. I have to know. Uh, in, in your poem about barbecue, about halfway through, you, you realize, oops, I made a mistake with this woman. And so you start explaining why it's important to you. And I got to know, did it work? <laughs> well, my poems always work. But <laughs> in all honesty, <laughs> Um, that's not a true story. Most of my poems are not true in the strictest sense, right? Um, but at the same time, um, I'm always honest, right? So I never, I, I may lie, but I'm always honest in my poetry. Um, but yeah, to be honest with you, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, really, barbecue. If you if you tell someone at a cookout that I love you like I love this barbecue. You don't even need a poem at that point as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'm really good with mundane questions. I, I, I just wanna jump in a little bit, uh, Scott, what you were saying about you know your poems not being true. I, yeah. I, love, I love sharing this with, um, there's a wonderful children's author, Patricia Polacco, and um, I got to, she's a, in Michigan, I got to hear her present a couple of times, and she talks about how um, she grew up loving stories because her Russian grandmother would tell all of the grandkids stories around the, uh, around the wood-burning stove, and she would tell these fantastical stories, and they would ask her, you know, grandma, grandma, are, are, this, are these stories true? And she would say, of course it's true may not have happened, but is true. And so there's, there's, a, there's a difference between true and factual. <laughs> I, I wanted to jump in to uh, a little bit of philosophical jargon. <clears throat> Some of us believe in the truth of myths, but not in a sense that they state literally described facts literally. Rather, they describe or express archetypes, deep truths, <clears throat> or open us up to those. And I think that art in general, poems specifically, are like myths. You know, they are not to be taken literally, but they are true because they express some deep, understanding of the world. <clears throat> so they are mythically or mythologically true or poetically true. I have to write a paper about it. I, can I go back to Robin real quick? Hey, Robin. I have a question for you. Hello. So you were kind of in all of the things that you were kind of breaking down and I don't, I don't I'm sorry I don't know how much time we have so I'm just going to float it and we'll see what happens. But I was wondering like how you have defined success for yourself and if you have done that. Um the reason why I ask is because um whenever someone comes to me and they, let's say they have an idea for an event or a program or because I do a lot of that, right? My first question is usually, um, how do you define the success of that thing? And so when people talk about, you know, how they're, um, like in your case, you were talking about being seen, right? To some extent and I guess I, I have the question I have for you is how are you defining when you have been seen? And I don't know if that you have that answer right now. And if you don't, that's fine. But if you do, I'd like to hear it. And if you don't, just say I don't have it and let's talk about it another time. Mm. Oh, that's a great, it's a wonderful thing to think about. I, I do 
talking about success, defining success, I, you know, I often, we talk to my students about what success means to them, which will be quite different from perhaps what success means um, to a consumer, you know, capitalist consumerist society, you know, that we're all kind of indoctrinated into and led along through, but invisible, but in that going to the question of invisibility, that's a, it's a question to ponder for a while. What does that mean for me um, in terms of, um, yeah, you know, I suppose I do think about that more in terms of a professional life and, and less in terms of, I do have, feel very fortunate to have a, our community, a, a beautiful community here of artists uh, and uh, enrich friendships among uh, students and, and friendships and and women, you know, that are close to with my ex you know experience and not of my experience. Um, but I I think term professionally and also I think that in terms of having a, a and I suppose this is why I uh, created the Switchgrass Review Journal also because I recognize that there that there often isn't a space for women, people of color, LGBTQ to be heard often, you know, what, so whether in the artistic world or in the professional world, these voices are often silenced. Our histories, our experiences are, are not heard. As we labor in the professional world and give service in ways that are never recognized. And so that's just starting to touch um, and especially as we get older, and I can't even fathom as a, as a person of color how the experience would be um, in terms of not having um, the, your, your, in terms of not having your labor and your, your work uh, and your thoughts and experiences heard. Um, but I, I just, but I don't want to take up all the time here. I'm sorry, I appreciate the question. So needs i need to think about that a lot longer um but thank you no it's cool yeah. and to be honest with you that's kind of work that never ends right like if you are actively doing the work of something and it is something you have committed to and it is on an issue as large and broad and ancient as class and racism and sexism right um, and all of the isms. If yeah. you are doing work in those veins, that is work that, at least in your lifetime, will not end. And so you always, in my, at least for me, I always, let me say me, I always have to keep checking in to see where the markers are, right? Mm -hmm. Am I speaking for me or am I speaking for my people or am I speaking for my community or am I speaking for the project that I'm working on or am I only speaking on this one poem? You know, I have to be completely honest with myself as I go so I can best define or determine if the work is effective, am I succeeding, is it productive? Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would just put on the table because only you know those answers, right? And I'm looking at a couple of comments over here in the chat and like McKay says, could it be that to feel seen is something felt in the body? And yet, and I'm like, well, maybe for McKay, you know, but that's not, there's no fixed answer to how we determine it, except for the one you fix for yourself. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Um... But Hi, um, this is Odelia, sorry, let me, let me put the, um, I just wanted to ask um, what you all thought about, um, because a lot of really important things have been said, I don't wanna go over them all, but to me, spirituality is just my life. It's like, I don't, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Christian, I don't go to church on Sunday, not that I haven't done those things, of course, uh, having grown up um, in uh, Latinx and, Native and indigenous family, we did have to do that when we were, when I was little, but to me, I think it's how we walk in the world it is what our spirituality is. And I was wondering if any of you, what maybe your thoughts were on that. And I, I think you already have answered it, but um, 
if anybody else wanted to speak to that really quick. Thanks. Odelia. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally, I feel that question. I, I grew up a Catholic, right? Uh, as well, I was an altar boy. I went to Catholic school uh, for three years till they kicked me out. When the first place I got kicked out of, but you know, um, I don't, I don't, I, in some ways I think religion is, is antithetical and that's not a new thought to spirituality. And, and uh, it's just like creativity. It, it, you know, I draw the parallel. Like if you have a formula that you use to fill in the blanks to create your poem or your painting or your dance, then at that point, I, I think, you know, you're probably, you're probably a little bit lost. Uh, I, I, think, I think that by letting go of those things, right, is, is where, I, for me anyway, true spirituality starts to happen, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's okay to, to be religious and I don't think it necessarily precludes or excludes being spiritual, but a lot of times form without substance becomes that reality, you know? Uh, so so when you say just live in your life is your spirituality, I think that's a beautiful thing, you know? I mean, I, I uh, would like to think that, you know, well, for me anyway, like making empanadas is, is, a, is a spiritual act, you know? Uh, the most spiritual ones are the, are the sweet potato, the camote, empanadas de camote. Those are the most spiritual ones for me. Uh, so, I, I, you know, th this idea that, that we're going we're gonna to create definitions, we're going to define poetry, and we're going to say this is poetry, and this isn't, and this is spirituality, and this isn't. All that's artificial. We make all that up. We make it all up, just like we can make up our own spirituality. When I work with young people and I tell them, I say, you know, for a long time, there were people in academia that said the beats, God bless you, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the beats, that's not beat, that's not even poetry. That's not real poetry. That's garbage. My God, that's, you know, but now the beats are taught in major universities all around the world. What changed? people's minds. The beats didn't go change, you know, Kerouac and Ginsburg didn't go back and like, oh, I'm going to change my poetry to make it more suitable for academia. Ferlinghetti, et cetera, they stayed who they were, but people came around to understanding that whatever they had considered about the beats was this limited sort of framework. And then over here, there are the beats and that's valid and that's beautiful and it's poetry. So your life, spirituality, hell yeah. I, I wanted to add to it. Quoting you, Danny. Um, I also grew up as an older boy and Catholic. And then, I had, and then I had an experience with Buddhists, you know, and like people who come to our home think I'm a Buddhist because, you know, you see this art, you know, and the meditation cushion and shit like this. But like from my point of view, religion of any form was limiting. But that's my attitude. That's, that's a matter of my attitude. Because for somebody else with a different attitude, it may be opening. Uh, so, you know, like everything, like words, like poems, like art, ultimately, it's about what we do with it. Um, you know, some, some things may be good for, for some people and not good for other people. Religion in terms of structures and forms, not good for me. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, one of the most badass poets I know is um, Sister Luella, who's not, I don't know if she's here this year at the festival, but she writes some amazing poems and she's a, she's a nun, you know? So of course, um, I was just saying for me personally, I think that spirituality um, takes a lot of different forms. Right. And you know, that, that was all I was trying to say and just was asking what y'all thought about it. So thank you so much. Um, Tom, Tom let me know 
Um, yeah, on. if we if we could wrap it up in the in the next five minutes, that'd be great because uh, we we're gonna take a we're gonna take a, like a, a two hour break or an hour and a half now. We're gonna start the uh, next panel. The the Corpus Christi Writers Anthology is gonna start at seven o'clock with uh, Bill Mays uh, doing that. Uh, but we want to have uh, everybody. Uh, to enjoy this a bit more. And then, um, but if you can do the survey too, uh, uh, please uh, do that for this panel. And then uh, too, you can go back to the website and to go on for the Zoom for later. And then there's also, there's a, a lot of the poets have their books for sale on underneath their bios or in the, in the store. So please do that um, and everything. We've had a great panel though. You guys are, I, I love this talk about it myself. Um, I'm actually working, putting out a, a book. It's called uh, Snake Woman uh, Moon. That's a, a kind of the spirituality of, of a forgotten culture that goes all the way back to, to Avebury, which is a stone circle area or, uh, just north of, uh, of um, uh, Stonehenge. And so kind of trying to, to channel what it was like to be there at that time and stuff. So I, I, I think I agree with you guys. Uh, some of you is like, you, you make your own uh, spirituality, oh. you know, and that, that's, uh, you find what you want and what works for you. And I think that's important. Tom? Yes. Uh, that was too much. No, no, no but like, <laughs> can, like can, can I say a thing? Yeah, sure. So just, just to let you know that I was thinking long time and very hard whom to have on the panel. It was very careful process. A lot of things went into my process, but I just really exceeded my expectations. Yeah, um, you put together a great panel. In fact, you were one of the first ones. Usually you're the last. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, so I wanted to thank you especially um, Kari, because you had most the doubts of four of us. So thank you so much for, uh, or more doubts than, than, than the rest of us. So that's, that's a thing. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Two other things. Uh, Tom already mentioned that, but remember that some of us, it's also a matter of our livelihood. So visit, visit our bios. Some of the poets have merchandise for sale. So, you know, click on the links and buy the books, help us out. Uh, so that's one thing. I don't have anything for sale. I had another poem which I didn't know I will read or not, but if you guys ask me via email, I'll send you both of my poems, which I prepared for today. Uh, and I really don't have Anything else to say except just one more time, Kari, Danny, Scott, thank you so much for visiting us. Thank you. Thank you everybody for hanging out here an extra half hour. Um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you to all of you. I just wanna say, it's. I think it's great, Stefan, that you're saying that you, Kari, had the most doubt and yet, in my opinion, the opinion of Danny Solis. You were the best. No offense, Scott. But you, you <laughs> win the panel <laughs> slam. No panel slam. No, I'm just kidding. You were great, though. You were great. I think it's a perfect example of how, how spiritual uh, or spirituality isn't just one thing. It's not, right. and it's also not this separate thing. Like, I'm going to go be spiritual now. Here I go. And, and I think the same thing with poetry, right? And um, I think, and, and I tell kids this, and it's in Ferlinghetti's poem, What is Poetry? Which I didn't know till I heard parts of it on NPR. Poetry is dance. It's slicing lemons. It is a funeral for a pet. It, it, you know, it is all those things. It is, it, is, it is, you know, your favorite sweatshirt that you slip into. Man, that's, that's a good poem. When it's cold, you're a little bit chilly and you put that on. You know, that, that first cup of coffee in the morning, how much poetry is in that? And that cup of coffee, for me, probably all of the poetry I've ever done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you, it. everybody. Thank you, everybody. All right, I'm going to close it up now. You guys take care, though. Please come back for our, our later session, and, and hopefully you'll come back for another time at the festival.
All right. Thank you so much. Thanks to the organizers. Yo, thank Danny, you. it was good to see you again. Balabahumba days, year 2000. It was like 20 years ago. And I just remember how beautiful you were on that stage, you know. <laughs> just, wow. Much too kind. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was a great time driving all the way from Albuquerque to the ocean, <laughs> ocean marching to the sea. It was great. And I thank Stefan and all the organizers and Scott and Carrie and the wonderful people that were in the uh, in the panel, in the audience. And uh, thank you for the great questions. And thank you, Tim, for showing up. Mr. Tim Siebels, always in, in your debt, sir. Um, but thank you. So. Got to go get dinner now. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close the meeting now, everybody. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Good night, all. Good night.